At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. You know, I get ready to do the recording and I get all set up, the, the intro plays, and then I get distracted and, and I forget that I'm supposed to pay attention and come in when I'm announced. Well, I'm here now. If this is your first time to the Cannabis Podcast, you may be a little disappointed, but you're going to find a whole bunch of information on cannabis for the next 30 or 40 minutes. And if you're coming back, welcome back. This podcast is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume cannabis responsibly. This episode, we have a plethora, I like using that word occasionally, a plethora of things we're going to talk about. In fact, we're going to look at a bit of science behind the munchies. Everybody gets them. Well, that's not true. A lot of people get the munchies. I get them on occasion. We're going to look at why we get the munchies. Also, we have some surprising facts that the authors of the story suggest that you probably don't know we're going to go to Leafly for a story about some pot shop panic that's happening in especially the Ontario market, where they now have a plethora of stores. <laughs> and now they're starting to worry about whether they have too many. And kind of on the other side, we're going to look at another story, this from our friends at OkanaganZ.com. And this is actually a story from a couple of months ago, where they looked at places that have decided not to allow cannabis stores are, in fact, doing themselves more harm than good, because where legal cannabis shops are, a lot of people will buy legal weed. On Call of Our Corner, we're going back to some broken coast, and we splurged. We got an ounce of amnesia haze. I was not disappointed. <laughs> That's coming up on Cult of Our Corner. And we're going to dive into the memory banks and see if we can pull up a story that involves my friend Gord and how he used to be a very poor trimmer, which resulted in a pretty good bounty for me. All of that and more on episode 86 of the Cannabis Podcast. And let me throw out a couple of housekeeping reminders. Have you checked out Good Pods yet? Good Pods is a great app to check out podcasts on. In fact, if you do so, you can join in with the throngs. <laughs> I use that word with a, a bit of trepidation. The throngs of people who have made the Cannabis Podcast last week, number two, in the top 100 performing arts charts. Pretty cool. Thank you so much for listening. It's you, the listeners, obviously, that make that selection. I have nothing to do with it other than to present what we do. So check out Good Pods if you have not yet already. It's a great place to get your podcasts. I also want to send a couple shout-outs to a couple people who bought me a doobie. My good buddy, J.S. from Quebec, who you've heard about before on the podcast. He's been a long-time listener. He bought me a doobie. So did a buddy named Alan. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate your support. If you like what you hear and you feel like adding some support yourself, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. And then I'll get to do a shout out for you too. Now, let's get down to the stories. And we're going to start off with an appropriate one for a show on cannabis, the munchies. <laughs> How long have we been dealing with the munchies? Well, I guess as long as we've been smoking cannabis. <laughs> there have been times in my life where I have been a real munchie guy and just dove into bags of chips and munched them all up after smoking some weed. I don't get quite as carried away these days. What's your munchie habit? Do you, do you find yourself there's a certain strain, perhaps, that leads you down that path? This is a story from 420intel.com. The science behind marijuana and the munchies. Now the next time you're in the middle of a smoke session with friends and the munchies hit, you can offer an explanation behind why it's happening. Having access to your favorite meals or snacks is essential to any successful session. Most people are familiar with the concept of getting the munchies after consuming marijuana, but why they occur still remains a mystery to many. Even though the munchies may seem like one of life's unsolved mysteries, there are a few scientific reasons that can explain what causes it. Here are a few factors that help explain why people get the munchies after consuming marijuana. Want to keep the munchies at bay? 
you may want to make sure you get enough sleep. Numerous studies attribute an increase in appetite to a poor sleep schedule. According to a 2019 study, a lack of sleep can bring on the munchies in an identical manner to consuming marijuana due to the fact that sleep restriction causes increased endocannabinoid levels in the blood leading to hunger pangs, specifically for high-calorie foods. We found that sleep restriction induced qualitative changes in food intake, biasing choices toward energy-dense options without altering total calorie intake, wrote researchers. Adding that, our results further elaborate on the effects of sleep deprivation on the human brain, suggesting that neural processing of odors is enhanced in primary olfactory brain areas after sleep restriction. Taking this into consideration, Getting a full night's rest could be instrumental in helping to ward off the munchies. One of the many clichés about marijuana shared by the cannabis enthusiasts is that it just makes everything better. I like that line as a bit of an aside. <laughs> I guess that's why they included it, isn't it? <laughs> Research proves that this idea is more than just a cliché. According to a 2014 study using mice, Neuroscientists discovered that THC stimulated the brain's olfactory bulb, the part of the brain responsible for recognizing odors, causing the mice to eat more than usual. There's also data that suggests THC stimulates receptors in the hypothalamus, leading to the production of the hormone ghrelin, which regulates hunger. One of the key reasons people use substances like marijuana in the first place is to experience a release of dopamine. While there are a lot of benefits to how a dopamine release can make you feel, one of the drawbacks is that it can lower your inhibitions. While decreased inhibitions are typically associated with social settings, they can also have a big impact on cravings. Lowering inhibitions means eating more of foods that you probably shouldn't be eating in the first place. Think about it. After consuming enough marijuana, knowing when to stop snacking can feel nearly impossible. The reason why is because dopamine controls the brain's rewarded pleasure centers. Once enough THC has been consumed, it's nearly impossible to tell yourself enough is enough when it comes to your favorite food. The munchies may be mildly inconvenient, but at least it's no longer a mystery. Now the next time you're in the middle of a smoke session with friends and the munchies hit, hey, you can sound like the smart one and offer up an explanation behind why it's happening. Well, that not, may not make the munchies go away. It will at least provide a bit of a distraction until you're able to satisfy those cravings for good. And that is a story from 420intel.com. Get a good night's sleep if you want to avoid the munchies. From the Cannabis-Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And by the way, the cannabis infusion that has taken place to this point in the program is thanks to my buddy Jeff and the folks at Smoker Farms, Master Kush Ultra. If you haven't tried it already, you should. <laughs> Now, let's get to the next story. See, I, I got distracted. Somehow that happens when you imbibe, doesn't it? This is a story from Leafly.ca. Pot shop panic plaguing the Canadian cannabis industry. Politicians are panicking about retail cannabis, but the industry is not amused. In the last month or two, local news reporters across Ontario have emerged from the pandemic and seemingly noticed to some shock that cannabis retail has exploded. There are a 1,000 licensed stores in Ontario and just over 2,700 across Canada. These cannabis retail stores, which mainstream media insist on calling pot shops, are often concentrated in urban commercial areas. But unlike other businesses, like convenience stores or coffee shops, the spread of cannabis retail has been treated as a cause for concern among residents and politicians. Are there too many pot shops in your neighborhood? asks the Toronto Star. Harsh reality setting in for cannabis merchants as pot shops multiply, writes the CBC. In Bloomberg, we hear that analysts are beginning to sound the alarm. You get the point. In 2018, Ontario received a lot of press about the lack of cannabis retail locations due to their confusing lottery system. Well, now Ontario is once again in the spotlight two and a half years later for having too many cannabis stores. For a lot of people within the cannabis industry, the sudden attention to the spread of cannabis retail is a bit confusing. After all, a private market was what the province opted for in 2018. It may have taken a while to ramp up, but the private market approach certainly led to a lot of cannabis shops. But is this truly a case of too many? Ontario surpassing 1,000 stores is exactly what experts predicted when legalization began. 
Last month, two Toronto councillors backed a provincial opposition bill that would grant cities power to regulate where retail cannabis stores open in an attempt to promote retail diversity. We're seeing less variety and diversity in the number of retailers, councillor Kristen Wong Tam claimed to CBC. I don't think a day goes by that there's not at least one news item about the number of stores in Ontario or Toronto, says cannabis industry lawyer Chad Finkelstein. I have friends and family who call and say, how could there be so many stores? Can they all survive? Many people, he says, seem to want to assign blame for this, as if a thousand stores represented a market failure. Since Ontario hit the milestone, cannabis shops are being treated by politicians like an urgent concern. It's created a very funky dynamic, says Mimi Lamb, founder of the Sue Pret family of stores in Ottawa and Toronto. There is a degree of dismay among retailers like Lamb and lobbyists like Retail Cannabis Council of Ontario President Adam Bassos about the idea of allowing for more involved regulation from cities in the province. Bassos explains that while the numbers grew quickly, there are positive sides to the boom in retail stores. It's made for a more competitive market, which ultimately benefits the consumers, and is helpful in reducing illicit cannabis sales, which, after all, was the main goal of legalization in the first place. Instead, a better approach might be to fix what is wrong with cannabis retail. I'd love to be able to curate my cannabis products the way I want to curate them, says Lamb. She'd love to sell more merch or let people hang out in her stores, but she can't. Not yet, anyway. So-called pot shops could be lively community hubs if they weren't so heavily regulated. Stores seem dull and lifeless from the outside. The regulations treat them more like adult novelty stores than the LCBO. That's actually the biggest problem I have. It isn't the volume of cannabis stores, Finkelstein says. I think neighborhoods and communities lose when you've got all these covered windows. In Ontario, stores are required to keep cannabis products out of public view, so curtains, frosted glass, long entryways, walls are used so that no one is able to see inside. And as an aside, it's the same way here in B.C. It cuts the inside of the stores off from the world outside, which can be dangerous for staff and intimidating to customers. You've got store after store where there's something is lost, visually, optically. When everything looks like it's boarded up, it's not an appealing visual. Well, like it or not, this is what we wanted, the billion-dollar industry that legalization was always meant to create. We should be treating legalized cannabis as a legitimate retail venue and not some dirty secret to be hidden behind tinted glass. And that takes me back a couple episodes to my reference of my friend who wouldn't come in to visit the store because of that stigma of that dirty little secret. Wow, we're still there. But now, here is a contrasting story on retail from my buddy at the OkanaganZ.com. When legal cannabis shops are plentiful, people buy legal. Despite Canada approaching its third anniversary of cannabis legalization, some municipalities still ban licensed shops. Other countries talking about legalizing cannabis also seem inclined toward minimizing legal access. Now, this study and story is by Michael J. Armstrong, who's an associate professor of operations research at the Goodman School of Business, Brock University. And this story is a special to the OZ. And in his study, he compared per capita growth in store numbers, recreational cannabis sales dollars, and user numbers from 2018 to 2020 in Canada. Stores and sales were strongly related. Differences in provincial store growth explained 46% of the differences in sales growth. That's a lot, given that many other factors like pricing, consumer tastes, and weather also affect sales. By contrast, store growth explained just 8% of user growth. A simple quarterly trend better explained the user increases. In other words, almost the same user growth occurred regardless of how many shops opened. But where shops were plentiful, users increasingly bought legally. One reason for the weak stores and users' relationship was that user estimates came from government surveys with large error margins. They may not detect subtle changes. The black market provides another likely reason. Licensed shops clearly increase access to legal products, but they only marginally increase overall access if illegal dealers are already widespread. Consider the southern Ontario city of Hamilton. In January 2019, the city had 34 illegal dispensaries and countless online dealers. So when the first licensed shop opened three months later, it suddenly made legal products accessible. But the city's total cannabis supply barely budged. Advertising restrictions likely played a role. Cannabis retailers couldn't use ad blitzes or free samples to stimulate demand. 
Canada's 2018-20 user growth might have instead come from legalization's removal of criminal penalties. That could have encouraged non-users to start, regardless of whether shops open nearby. Or the growth might have just represented ongoing trends. Canada's cannabis use had been increasing since 2010. His study analyzed province-level outcomes, but it has implications for other government levels, too. At the municipal level, politicians banning licensed stores might think they're protecting residents. But Mr. Armstrong's study implies communities will see similar user growth after legalization, whether they allow shops or not. Those users will increasingly buy legally if local shops open. But without such stores? Users will keep visiting illicit sources where products might be misrepresented or contaminated. This means community store bans could lead to more crime and health problems rather than less. It's probably okay for politicians to briefly delay store licensing while they update local regulations, but beyond that, retail opt-outs risk becoming political cop-outs that hide problems instead of addressing them. Similar logic applies at the national level when countries legalize. For example, Mexico's courts ruled in 2018 that cannabis should be legal there, but its Congress still hasn't passed legislation. One proposed bill would have legalized cannabis but made it very inaccessible. South Africa has been similarly slow at implementing its own court's 2018 ruling. Cannabis legalization is complex. Canada is still learning from its experiences, and hopefully other countries can learn from them too. A very interesting perspective from Mr. Michael J. Armstrong, Associate Professor at the Goodman School of Business, Brock University, and a special to the OkanaganZ.com, and you again can catch the link when you check out CannabisPodcast.com. And this next story from 420intel.com is a story that is probably about America, but I think there's a lot of similarities to Canada as well. And these are eight surprising cannabis facts you probably didn't know. Cannabis in all its forms is more prevalent and accessible than ever before in this country. Still, it often seems that much of its story is mysteriously unknown. Health studies are still very new, and it sometimes may seem that the plant had no relevant history before the 1900s. As cannabis becomes more prevalent, perhaps it's time to discover the lesser-known facts about this iconic plant to help understand what exactly makes cannabis so interesting and important. Here are eight fun facts you may not have known about this elusive organism we call weed. Cannabis dates back thousands of years. It's easy to assume marijuana cultivation began in fairly modern times. However, the first recorded use of cannabis dates back thousands of years before the United States was even an idea. Cannabis was mentioned in the sacred Hindu text known as the Vedas, estimated to have been produced around 2000 to 1400 BC. Woven hemp fibers were even discovered at a burial site in Taiwan that date back to 10,000 years. As marijuana becomes legal for recreational use, its retail popularity is skyrocketing. In the last few years, the marijuana dispensaries are becoming more plentiful than Starbucks and even McDonald's in some areas. In Denver and Portland, for example, marijuana retailers outnumber Starbucks by close to double, according to MJ Biz Daily. Some states have a cap on the number of dispensaries they allow, but this statistic is certainly telling. If you've ever taken a whiff of a particularly hoppy craft beer and thought you smelled weed, your nose wasn't far off. Beer hops, or humulus, it turns out are the same family of flowering plants as cannabis. They confirmed that humulus and cannabis were very closely related and belonged in a single family, Cannabinaceae, according to Popular Science. The two plant species may inspire two very different final products, but sometimes the smell is practically indistinguishable. It may sound strange, but recent studies have concluded marijuana affects women differently than it affects men. The entire THC experience may be different for men and women, from the amount needed to get high to tolerance levels. The main way the cannabis acts differently in women, as opposed to men, is its interaction with the female production of estrogen. Canvases have been landing place for some of the most important artwork throughout time. Historically, canvases were often made with the assistance of cannabis. In fact, cannabis was so important to canvas production that it inspired the name. The word canvas is related to the word cannabis. Historically, canvases were made of hemp. There exists great debate when it comes to who exactly started e-commerce. Still, there was a day in the early 1970s that is often regarded as the first internet transaction and it involved marijuana. 
1971 or 1972, Stanford students using ARPANET accounts at Stanford University's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory engaged in a commercial transaction with their counterparts at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, wrote John Markoff in his 2005 novel What the Domhouse Said, how the 60s counterculture shaped the personal computer industry. Before Amazon, before eBay, the seminal act of e-commerce was a drug deal. Although marijuana is now frequently regarded as safe, it does come with some potential health side effects that are not always known. One potential health side effect of marijuana is an added strain on your cardiovascular system. Marijuana can affect your heart in several ways, including raising resting heart rate, dilating blood vessels, and making the heart pump harder, according to Harvard Medical School. Hemp has a long history in the United States. Not only did Thomas Jefferson and George Washington both have it on their properties, but the famous Mayflower had sails and ropes made of hemp. The first two drafts of the United States Declaration of Independence were written on paper made from hemp. The cherry on top of all this history woven with hemp lies within the first manufactured symbol of this nation. The first American flag, made by Betsy Ross, was made from industrial hemp. Many of the very first American flags were made from hemp cloths, so there's a real tie into our country's history and the important role industrial hemp played in agriculture in our country, says Representative Jared Polis, who authored an amendment to the Farm Bill which allows industrial hemp research in states where it is legal. So from the Mayflower to the American flag and even the first Internet purchase, cannabis has hid in plain sight. The plant has woven a sometimes hidden but always interesting path over time. And I would have to agree, the path of cannabis is always interesting. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12-15 to to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lift Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, Everyone loves Lifting Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we've treated ourselves. We typically pick up an eighth to do the Cultivar Corners with. But I wanted to see if there was a difference between what's happening out there in the legal world from the eighth perspective and an ounce. And we got a particular ounce into the store and just feeling it made me decide this was the one I wanted to try as my special treat for my birthday. So what I picked up was an ounce of Broken Coast Amnesia Haze. Oh, (laughs) amazing, amazing notes on this one. Oh, so fruitful. Lime and and, and lemon, so some citrus notes, obviously. Uh, Really, really nice. And (laughs) many times we've talked about on the Cannabis Podcast, in Cultivar Corners, the size of the buds. How much does the size of the buds truly matter? (laughs) When I opened up this package of Broken Coast Amnesia Haze, (laughs) I showed it to a couple other people and we were aghast. In essence, this 28 grams, this ounce, was about seven different buds. The largest of which was 5.7 grams, one of the buds inside of this. So there is not anything even resembling a popcorn bud in this ounce. They're all very, very big. Mm, and cured marvelously and trimmed. Like when you look at the trim, that's just bud. There's not a single bit of sugar leaf sticking out on any of these marvelous up to five gram buds. Wow, wow, wow. Took a look at it with the jeweler's loop, of course. And the trichome fields are vast. Oh, and lots of amber on this one. Mm Mm-hmm. And such a delightful aroma. Now, here's the kicker. I've been really impressed with the flower itself. 
the packaging. Now I've got it in a glass jar, of course, once it's been opened. But where things started to fall apart is when I went to the Broken Coast website. I figured, listen, any cannabis company that is creating this kind of a product mm, that has this wonderful little of a nose on it, and we're about to find out how much of a big hit this has on it, they've got to have some great information on their website, right? <laughs> That's what I thought, anyways. I went to the Broken Coast website to look up the information for Amnesia Haze. And you may not believe this, but they don't actually have any information on the strain on the, the website. <laughs> they have a number of them. And believe me, I went through this little uh, circular thing about 17 times <laughs> before I realized it was not going to change. There is no Amnesia Haze listed under their products on the website. So I had to go to a different source to get the information on Amnesia Haze, and it is a little scant as well. THC on this Amnesia Haze is at 23.3%. There is no indication on the bag of what the terp percentage is. No indication of that on the website either. But I did go to Pop the Magic, and I found a page there that has some description on Amnesia Haze. And they're suggesting that Amnesia Haze has a distinct terpene profile of uplifting lemon and citrus notes. Well, I definitely picked those up accompanied by energetic spice, earth, and zesty aromas. So the spice tells me there's probably going to be some caryophylline in there, the earthy, perhaps some myrcene. The zesty aromas could be some linalool, I suppose. The sativa marble should satisfy even the most discerning with its lime green buds that are so thickly covered in trichomes that you may have trouble letting go. <laughs> and it was a little sticky. I pulled off, obviously, when I try to put one of these five grab buds and pick it up on my finger, it does not stick. But I did pull off a couple of little buds off of one of those, and there was some stickability. It did it did have some, some stickiness that stuck to my finger as I hung it up. Again, I am really, really impressed with the, with the size and the beauty of these buds. The trichome fields, absolutely massive. And that's always something I really like to see when I'm looking at good cannabis. Is just vast trichome fields because you know that they're just going to be really tasty. Oh, and this one does not disappoint. Now, I learned a lesson the last episode. I've already got my joint rolled. I'm going to turn on the vaporizer so it's ready to rock when we are. And I think it's time that we have a taste of Broken Coast Amnesia Haze. And I am expecting this one to hit like a sativa fairly hard and, and fairly heavy. Let's take a peek. Oh, very flavorful on the joint. Mmm, some of those citrus notes. Mmm, some of that earthiness. Can pick up a bit of that spiciness. Mmm, smooth smoke. Wonderful moisture levels. Now, there was a boost pack in it, um, not a... Uh, not the other one, the Bovita. This was a boost pack, Integra Boost. Uh, very nice moisture levels. Uh, did have to grind it. Didn't quite wrap up in my fingers, but really, really nice. Holy moly. And speaking of really nice, <laughs> here it comes. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> wow. In the time that it took my vaporizer to warm up, I've already had what, two or three hits off the joint. <sighs> I've already got some happy eyes. <laughs> As you know, I've never wanted to just let that sit, so <laughs> let's pop over to the vaporizer and see what the taste of Broken Coast Amnesia Haze is. Mmm. <sighs> The same flavorful notes that were in the smoke, but now magnify them about tenfold. Mmm. And those flavor notes just trip off your tongue. Oh. Happy eyes are coming on stronger. In the middle of my two-fisted smoking approach, joint in the left hand, vaporizer in my right. Mmm. So since one of the points 
of going for this cultivar was to treat myself for a, a birthday celebration. I think it was fairly successful. From the very first feel of the bud in the bag to the first view of these massive <laughs> and exceptionally well-trimmed buds. Wow. Paid a little bit more than normally do, but you know what? Sometimes it is worth paying a little bit more for your weed. I know you can get under $100 ounces these days in the legal market if you shop around a little bit. But I am not disappointed at all. <laughs> wow. So fast. Just came on. And that kind of ties into this piece that I found on Puff the Magic. They say the high starts with euphoric vitality, buzzing with creativity. I think I would agree with that to this stage. Immediately after inhalation, the rocket ship launch overwhelms our senses with euphoric acceleration. <laughs> well, yeah, based on how fast that came on to me, I think you guys have captured it as well. Ten minutes later, there's panic in the air. Buckle up, because then time stops. We have enough energy to run a marathon, and for those who like getting an edge to the high, amnesia haze is your strain. It's it's like too much coffee. Well, I'll let you know if that happens, if I remember to turn the microphone on again. <laughs> so far, that initial description of that very fast bang-on euphoria, definitely right on. I haven't had anything lately that's come on that fast and that strong. And there you go, 23.3% THC, not, a, not an incredibly high THC value. Oh, but a really nice high. I am liking it. Broken Coast Amnesia Haze. I just forgot what I was talking about. And there's nothing like a little wake and bake on a Saturday morning of your birthday weekend to bring back some memories. And as promised, I'm going to dive back to tell you a story about my friend Gord. Now, I know I've mentioned Gord at least once. He was a good friend of mine for many, many years, good friend of both my brothers as well. And he lived in the same community as me a few years ago, and he was an exceptional grower. He got some clones from Horace, who I've also mentioned, and the Kootenays, uh, started out with a, some clones of some chemo. And this was the skunkiest weed here. <laughs> I haven't smelt anything since that that is really, truly so skunky. It, you, you feel like there is a skunk sitting under your table every time you smoke a little bit of it. But anyways, Gord was an exceptional grower, but his diligence didn't really follow through. Now, he harvested the weed well. It was dried appropriately, cured nicely. <laughs> it was in the trimming that Gord's process kind of fell apart, shall we say. Now, I can't honestly remember whether he hired a bunch of other people to, to do some trimming for him or whether it was mostly him. I suspect by the bounty he was doing, he probably had to hire a few people. <laughs> but... This one harvest year, after it was pretty well done, he came to me and he said, I, I don't know if you're interested, Gary, but I got some, I've got some shake and, and, and some of the stuff that's you know, left over from the harvest. I don't think it's, it's really worth much, and you, know, you can have it for next to nothing. And so I took a bag of it. <laughs> I took it home. And I started diving into it a little bit, and lo and behold... I didn't get far into it before I discovered a whole bunch of buds. The kind of buds that now we would probably call them popcorn buds. You know, I mean, quarter inch, maybe three quarters of an inch kind of thing. Not a lot of girth to them, but when you add them all up. <laughs> so in that first bag that Gord gave me, and in, in, in what was it? It was a, it was a big zip lock bag filled with, with leaves pretty well. That's what it looked like anyways. And I ended up with between about an eighth and, and a quarter of a significant amount of buds. And when I smoked those buds, they were strong chemo like the rest of the weed was. <laughs> so they didn't lose any potency in the fact that they were little tiny guys. <laughs> so with that discovery, I now faced a dilemma. Do I, do I like tell Gord that, you know, I, I found all of these, these buds in there and <laughs> And uh, I, I hate to say it, but, but I didn't. And I kept getting these bags. And in fact, I shared some of them with some of the people I was working with at, at the moment. And I became a, a pretty popular guy because I was not the only one to discover that within these bags of essentially what was supposed to be shake was a significant amount 
of some pretty decent potency in terms of the buds you were getting. <laughs> and I, re I remember that to this day, my first discovery of that. If you ever have a comment about anything you hear on the podcast or suggestions for guests or cultivars you'd like to hear, please send a note to info at cannabispodcast.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Cannabis Podcast. And if you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can head to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast and buy me a doobie. That's it for episode 86 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.